It wasn't at all clear until about 10 years ago that attrition rates in drug development were getting worse. Here's a classical representation of how attrition occurs, with one approved drug emerging from thousands of compounds discovered. Over the past decade, evidence has built up that attrition rates have been increasing. We now know that this is for different reasons and that it occurs at different phases. In the preclinical phase, the evidence suggests that increased attrition has been much less of a problem than at later stages of development. And it isn't clear that attrition was increasing before 2000, either at this stage or at phase one. But for phases two and three, we now know that deterioration attrition rates had started by 1990. In 2005, the FDA found that the percentage of phase one compounds ultimately reaching the US market had fallen from 14% to 8% since 1990. This represented a huge 75% increase in the attrition rate over the period. Additionally, the FDA found that the number of drugs that failed after reaching phase three had increased from 20% to 50% over a 15 year time span. Meanwhile, at the regulatory phase, there was only modest deterioration up to 2004. But after that, with the Vioxx affair, attrition rates increased sharply. The US authorities in particular became defensive under the strong criticism that resulted from this. That increasingly stringent period appears to have come to an end in 2011, at least as far as the US is concerned. As the recent upturn shows, the number of drug approvals there has much increased recently. So future studies of attrition are, in my view, likely to show a reduction in attrition rates at the regulatory stage from 2011. We have to know more about why attrition is happening to predict whether things are also likely to change at other development phases. But just like with cancer, there isn't just one type of attrition. So we have to understand, as best we can, what is affecting each type. A major study in 2011 from Italy by Pamoli et al concluded that the switching of R&D to higher risk areas, particularly cancer, was the main factor behind increased attrition. But we know that increased attrition has been happening at several different phases, started at different times and has applied to differing extents. Also, this study unfortunately entirely precedes the Vioxx affair and its impact. So I find this explanation too simple. Another factor behind attrition is that companies have been getting more discerning about which products they choose to take all the way through R&D. Two interesting studies by Thomson Reuters on attrition at phases two and three have recently shown that two factors, efficacy and commercial reasons, accounted for three quarters or more of all attrition over the six years to 2008. Have enabling technologies been particular culprits in increased attrition? Even here there are big differences. Combinatorial chemistry is one enabling technology which soon turned out not to be as predictive as it was expected to be in the 1990s. Nexavar is one of a very few drugs to result from this technology. But another enabling technology, high throughput screening, has, despite causing frustrations, actually paid off. 
If you analyse closely what has come out of HTS already, as McCarran et al. did in 2011, then you find that by then, 19 drugs had already been marketed, which originated from HTS hits. Here are some of the better known ones. As we learn more about how to use or abandon enabling technologies, that should reduce attrition rates. Another example, clinical trials which target a specific genetic population stand to have more positive outcomes. The recent wide introduction of this personalized medicine approach should already be having some impact in reducing attrition rates. It's cost a lot more in R&D investment to do it, but the industry has actually been quite successful in keeping drug productivity at least stable over the past decade. And this is in the face of serious increases in attrition rates at various points along the development pathway. So even if attrition rates just stop deteriorating, that could mean an upturn in the number of new products coming through development. And if, as I believe, some types of attrition actually decline, that could help further increase the number of new products we are now beginning to see reaching the market. To summarise, I think it's unlikely that the various factors adversely affecting attrition rates will continue with the same force that they did in the first decade of this century. With some of them heading in a positive direction, I believe there's a good chance of some decrease in overall attrition rates over the coming five years. In the previous webcast, I suggested that even with no change in attrition rates, the numbers of new products reaching the market should increase and any improvement in attrition rates should lead to a more positive projection than I made here, where I assumed no change in attrition rates. This is a promising outlook, but more products mean more activity, and from the outset, more strategic thinking. When internal knowledge requires a boost, or when resources are constrained, Transcript is well equipped to help in advising on the widening strategic opportunities and in developing new products to market and beyond.